Well, today we're continuing on in our series out of 1 Samuel called High and Low. And uh, we call it that because uh, this series has what's called uh, chiasms all throughout it, where a chiasm is where um, someone at the beginning of the story, who's often is someone who's high, who's elevated, he's often the, the bad guy of the story, uh, by the end of it, he's humbled and brought low. Um, and then uh, at the beginning of the story, there's someone that's low, that's faithful, that's obedient, that's uh, humble, and God will elevate them to the, by the end of the story. And today we are in chapters 15 and 16 of 1 Samuel. So feel free to turn there in your Bibles. You can pull it up on your smartphones. Uh, we have sermon notes in your bulletins that list the page numbers of the pew Bibles in front of you. You can also follow along as well on the screen. But uh, in these two chapters today, we see uh, a chiasm. We see uh, 15, chapter 15 is King Saul, the first king of Israel, is continuing to be brought low. He's continuing to be brought low. And in chapter 16, uh, we are introduced to a young, humble shepherd named David, who throughout chapter 6, we see him slowly be elevated by God. And uh, and so our, our big idea for a day is that disobedience leads to destruction. And we see that in King Saul with chapter 15. Uh, but God gives grace and provision to those who wait faithfully for him. And we see that with King, well, the future king, King David. Again, if you were here last week, remember in chapter 13, Saul, like I said, he's already starting to go down. He's uh, made some bad decisions. He was told by Samuel, the prophet of God, that he's supposed to wait in Gilgal for Samuel to arrive in order to, uh, to do the burnt sacrifices, in order to sacrifice to God to say that, hey, your kingship and also the next the battle we're about to go into is all going to be about God and God's deliverance, not about us. And Saul Again, Samuel didn't come in Saul's timetable, and so he decided on his own accord to do the burnt sacrifice, which a king is not, was not supposed to do. Only a priest was supposed to do that. Yeah, he took uh, matters into his own hands. But despite Saul's sin and disobedience, uh, what we see is that God is still gracious. And what we see here in chapter 15 is that God has given Saul another chance. Uh, we see that second chance right here, starting with verse 1. So Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to, to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. Again, God's being gracious, right? Uh, God's going to give him a second chance after what he did the, the, the previous, well, last week when we talked about it. And ch verse 2 uh, begins this message from the Lord. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I'll punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. So something happened many, many, many years ago that God is now bringing back to light. That there was a king named uh, Amalek, and the Amalekites did something awful to the Israelite people when they were leaving Egypt. Uh, I'm not going to put it on the screen, but you find this on, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 through 19. It tells us, in that chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 25, that while Israel was leaving Egypt, the Amalekites followed them. And they started to pick off the, the weary, the stragglers, the, the struggles. And basically, they, that they were a wicked, they still are a wicked and ruthless people, and God has not forgotten their sins. So now, justice is coming for them. Their evil is going to be judged. Justice is going to be delivered, and we see what that is going to look like in verse 3. It says, Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children, infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Verse 3, that's a, it's a, a terrifying and a shocking verse here. Again, when we read that, especially in our New Covenant eyes, uh, you know, our, our Jesus lens eyes, it's, it's hard to rationalize what's going on here. I wish I could take some time to kind of explain this, but just in a nutshell, what's going on here is that, you know, is we're, we're seeing a total removal of evil, that everything is being judged from this, this awful, awful people, that, again, it's severe, but what we see here, it's supposed to be a godly act of just punishment. Again, God is gracious, God is merciful, but God is also just. And so we see God uh, living out that justice here in 
this chapter. And we see this judgment here in verses 7 through 9. It says, Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the, the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. So God, uh, Saul and his army, they go and they defeat the Amalekites, but he captures their king alive. He doesn't judge him. In fact, he spares him and spares his life. Not only that, he spares you know, sheep and cattle and calves and lambs. Again, remember, Saul was supposed to destroy everything, right? He was going to be the instrument to execute God's judgment on the, this people, but Saul doesn't. He was not willing to completely destroy him. And it's not because he was gracious at all to these people. It's because he wants those things for himself. He's using the king uh, to declare his amazing greatness as his king, as uh, look how great I am by, by taking him. And he takes these animals in order to cr- increase his own wealth. He takes Agag to say, look at me, look how great I am. And he takes all those animals to increase all the wealth that he has. And Saul, he's using his position for his own benefit his own personal gain. God, he didn't want the king to use his position like that, to look out for himself like that. He wanted the king to be a blessing to the people, not to be a blessing just to himself. Again, Saul's not a blessing to the people. We've, we've read elsewhere in the last couple of weeks that actually Saul threatens the people. Kings were also meant to establish the justice of God, and Saul, he fails to do that here too. So, how does God feel about this? Let's read that in verse 11. And this is God speaking. He says, I regret that I have made Saul king because he's turned away from me and he has not carried out my instructions. So again, God right here, he's grieving. He regrets making Saul king. And that's, that's kind of hard for us maybe to understand a little bit because we know that God is sovereign. God is the one that, that made this decision. He knew this was going to happen. So how can he grieve? How can he be sad over this? How can he regret this? Well, again, God is definitely sovereign. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His character never, ever changes. But despite his char- character never, ever changing, his emotions change, though. Again, God delights. God grieves. Our God weeps. What we see here is that God, again, he's control of all the circumstances, but yet he can grieve over sin and evil. And that can be a comfort for us, is that, you know, God uh, knows the things that are going to happen to our lives, but he can still weep with us when we weep. He can still grieve with us when we, we grieve. That God can celebrate us when, with us when we celebrate. And so even though God is sovereign and in control, that's just, I feel like it's comforting to me to realize that God's emotions can come alongside me as well. So again, God's grieving over sin right here, and we read this in verse 12. It says, early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. But he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. So after his victory, Saul builds a monument to, to himself. And again, he's saying, look, people, look how great I am. Look what I have done for you. Look what I did. He's declaring his own greatness to his people. He's declaring his own glory. He's so proud of himself. He wants to get a round of applause from the people. And then verse 13 happens. Samuel, he comes up to Saul. He says, when Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. Saul is like to Samuel, look what I did. I'm, he's so proud of himself. I, I carried out the Lord's instructions. I've carried out God's commandments. Well, how does Samuel respond to that? Verse 14. But Samuel said, What is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? He's basically like, hmm, that, that's an interesting response right there. Again, you've carried out the command of God, but why do I hear sheep? Why do I hear other animals' noises? Again, you carried out the command of God, why do I hear your act of disobedience? 
Is Saul going to accept responsibility for this? Is he going to apologize? Nope, he's not. He's going to make another excuse, just like what we saw him do last week. He's going to blame his soldiers. He's going to blame the people. He says this in verse 15. It says, The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle, sacrificed to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. He's continuing to make excuses. He's blaming everyone else. He's blaming the soldiers, the people. That's his typical shield right there to protect himself. That's the kind of leader that he is. That again, they're the ones that did this. And then, as we move into verses 17 through 19, we see that Samuel, he's going to call out Saul's sin. He, Samuel, he's not going to overlook what Saul does. And he re- says this in verses 17 through 19. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy these wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? And Samuel is reminding Saul right here that God was the one who elevated him into this position to begin with. God's the one that put you in this position. And you, Saul, you've disobeyed. You took what you should not have taken for yourself. You took the plunder. You took the good things of the the people. And Saul, he again, he responds with excuses. He says this in verses 20 and 21. He says, but I did obey the Lord, and said Saul. I went on the mission that Lord assigned me, but I completely destroyed the Amalekites, but I brought back Agag, their king. It's the soldiers that took the sheep and cattle from the plunder. The best of all was devoted to God in order to sacrifice in the Lord your God at Gilgah. And Saul, he's continuing to justify his behavior. He's justifying his decisions. He's arguing with Samuel, the very prophet of God right here, He doesn't think he's done anything wrong. But again, Saul, he doesn't completely obey God. He obeys up to a a certain point, right? And then he does what he wants to do. Saul justifies his sin by covering it with a quote-unquote righteous behavior. He justifies evil by cloaking it with godly actions. And you know what? We can do the same, can't we? We can justify our sinful behavior with this disguise of godliness. You know, Saul, he's like saying, we kept the sheep, we kept the cattle so we can sacrifice it to God. And God and Samuel are like, you know, yeah, sure, sure you did. You did that for that, huh? Or you maybe if you've heard, you said this or you heard someone else say this, you know, I, I promise if I win money with a lottery ticket, I'm going to give everything to God. You're like, sure, sure you're going to do that, huh? Right. Again, what does God really want from us? What does God want from Saul? What does God want from his people? What does God want from from me and from you? Well, God desires obedience, not sacrifice. That's what he wants. He wants your heart. He wants you to listen and to obey. He wants you to, to trust him, even when it's hard, even when it's scary, even when things don't make sense. And you ask the question, will you trust me? That's what God wants. That's what Samuel says next here in verse 22. So Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. And Samuel, he's trying to give Saul a very valuable lesson right here. God says, will you just trust me? Will you obey me? I, get, I, I want your heart, not your money. I want your devotion and your life and your obedience. Not really your, your necessarily your skills and your talents. I want you. I want your heart. But after all this, Saul, he's finally going to confess. And we read this in verses 25 and 26. He says, Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. 
So Saul, he's confessing, uh, but he wants Samuel to go back with him so that really the people of Israel think that everything is okay, everything is fine. Is Samuel really, I'm sorry, is Saul really a repentant person? I don't think so. Remember, God has always been gracious to forgive. What God is showing us here in this passage is that there is an underlying issue there. There's something deeper within Saul that is far worse than just his mistakes. That he is a defiant, ungodly person. He's like, right now, okay, I did something wrong. Just, just come with me, Samuel, so the people know I didn't screw up. Uh, and that's the reason why he's doing right here. He's acting like a little kid to some degree. Just come with me so people don't know that I didn't do wrong. Again, he's not really repentant. But Samuel, he is not. He saw right through this. He knows what Saul's thinking, so he doesn't go with them. And then we read this in verses 27 and 28. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. So again, Saul just reaches out, he grabs Samuel's robe and, and tears it just a little bit, and Samuel immediately just goes, you've tore my robe. God is also tearing away your, my, his kingdom from you. And then Samuel, he exits. Again, right here, God has officially rejected Saul as king. Saul's disobedience has led to his demise. Again, what did God want from Saul? We see this in verse 32. And Samuel said, Bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him in chains, and he thought, Surely the bitterness of death is past. Again, what God wanted in this, this situation was judgment on evil. God wanted the removal of evil and wickedness. And so in verse 33, we read that evil, he's actually snuffed out as Samuel had Agag killed. And finally, in verse 34, the last verse of this chapter, we see the separation of Samuel and Saul, that they will not see each other again. Before we dig into chapter 16, I want to just take a second and ask the question, what are some lessons that we can learn from chapter 15? Well, the one is that unchecked sin that creeps in will actually come to destroy you. That unchecked sin will lead eventually to your destruction. That un Checked sin always destroys and always leaves death. Another way to say that is disobedience to God will lead to destruction. Again, you disobey and you do not believe what God is saying and speaking and guiding, it does not go well for you. Again, all sin destroys. And that's chapter 15 right here. So again, as we turn to chapter 16, we're going to see a wild contrast from 15. And God is still faithful. God is still good. God is humbling Saul. He's bringing him low, and now he's going to raise up another. Saul is humbled in chapter 15, and God's going to elevate someone else in chapter 16. And in chapter 16, we are introduced to David. So let's read verse 1. It says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So God's saying right here, I got another, God, uh, another king that's coming. And this king, he's going to be righteous. This king is going to listen and obey. This is a king whose heart is going to be uh, after mine. He's going to be a king that's going to come from the tribe of Judah. He's going to come from the town of Bethlehem. Does that kind of sound familiar to you? This, this, this king right here is going to be a shadow of the future king, the future king Jesus. So God, he sends Samuel to Bethlehem, and he says this in verses 3 and 4. He says, invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. And Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? So the elders of Bethlehem, they, they see that Samuel's there, and they're like, oh, the prophet of God is here. Great, and wonderful, what's this about? And they're, they're trembling, and they ask him if he comes in peace. And Samuel's response is here in verse 5. Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. 
Then consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So again, Samuel, he's getting ready to anoint the next king. The God, he's going to reveal to Samuel and to the nation, here is your, your next king. Before we see that, there's some key truths here I wanted to share. Again, verses 6 and 7, which we'll read here in a second, the key truth on here is we need to be careful on judging others by their, their physical attributes. And you need to be careful to judge someone based on their physical appearance, based upon their, their physical attributes. Because, because what you might see might not be what God sees. We all struggle with this, don't we? We, we struggle with this. And what's amazing is that after Saul was king, after, again, Saul was a tall, he was wealthy, he was handsome, he was fierce, he was king because of how he looked. Out, outwardly, he looked amazing, but inward, he was just full of sin. Again, after all this, Samuel, who experienced all this, he falls into this trap of outward appearance. And so let's read verses 6 and 7. It says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Elab and against the first son of Jesse and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In outward appearance, that's how Saul was picked, right? God saying this, this new king is not going to be picked that way. I think, again, that's a great reminder that, that God often chooses the, the, not the wise, not the strong, not the noble, but often he uses the, the ignorant, the weak, the lowly. And then God, he looks at the heart, right? In verses 8 through 10, And Jesse called Abinab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema passed by, but Samuel said, Nor has, he, has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So after each son, he's like, Nope, 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 not this one. In verse 11, Samuel's like, Do you have any more kids at all? Because, uh, again, it's not any of these guys. And Jesse's like, Well, there is the youngest, but he's out keeping the sheep. The son, he is the, the least He's a lowliest, a lowly, lowest, uh, whatever it is, lowly. Uh, but he, this, this son, he's, he's faithful. The son is faithful to his father. And he's faithful to being a shepherd. He's faithful to the Lord. And so Samuel asked Jesse to, to send for this, this kid, this youngest son. And David comes and he stands out. And God says this in verse 11. So the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. And God, right here to Samuel, he says, this guy, this, this little guy named David, he is the king. And then we read this in verse 13. It says, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And the, the spirit of God just comes powerfully onto the, the David, just in a powerful way. And again, this is a verse that's so easy to rush by. Yeah, I'm not really sure what all this entails, but one of the things I do know about this is that if God calls you to do something, he will provide the grace and the power to accomplish it. Again, that's, that's a true statement right there. And we may not always feel it. You may not think it. But God has called you to, to if God has called you to be this, well, he's going to give you the grace and the power and the provision to accomplish it. And so if you're a, a parent right now, especially young kids, and you just feel like you're, you're drowning at this moment, just remember that God has called you to be a parent to, to those kids, that kid. He's going to provide you the grace and the power and the provision to be a parent that you need. If you're struggling with your marriage right now, uh, to, guess what? God's called you to be faithful. If you're struggling, remember that he provides grace and power and the provision to be what you need to be. Again, whatever decision, whether uh, it's in your school or your workplace or whatever it is, just know that God has called you there. God is faithful. He's faithful to give you the grace and the provision and the, the power needed. Again, is it hard? Yeah, it's hard. But God is faithful. 
But in contrast to that, what we read here in verse 14, actually God pulls the plug on Saul. The Spirit of the Lord rushes upon David, and now we see this in verse 14. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord has departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. This is a very uh, unique verse right here. So, you know, God's Spirit leaves Saul, but I want to remind us as believers, as followers of Jesus today, that the, God's Spirit does never departs those who follow him. Again, that's an important thing that God is faithful in that. But again, notice, again, God's Spirit leaves Saul, and then an evil spirit comes on Saul. And this Saul, the Spirit comes from God. And God's not doing this, but God's allowing this to happen. God's giving permission for this evil spirit to come and torment Saul. Well, why would God allow this to happen? Well, one reason is, is order, in order for the inwardness of Saul to come out. The spirit who torments Saul is going to cause what's deep down inside of him to come up to the surface. Again, what we see over and over and over again is that Saul, he's a corrupt dude. He's jealous. He's paranoid. He's a, he'll, he'll be a murderous man. And that evil spirit's going to cause that uh, to come up even more and more so. Uh, another reason why God's allowing this to happen is what we see, start to see here in verse 16. Again, God has anointed David as king in verse 13. Is David king yet? Is he on the throne yet? No, he actually still has, has years and years until this happens before he goes on the throne. But it's through this spirit, this evil spirit, that God allows doors to be opened to help move David to that throne. We read this in verse 16. This is, uh, this is Saul's servants talking to him. He says, Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you and you will feel better. So Saul has all these servants around him trying to, to care for him with this being tormented by this evil spirit. And his servants say, hey, we got an idea. Let's come bring someone who's skilled musically, skilled uh, leading worship music to calm Saul down. Well, guess who's called? In verse 18, so as one of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. And the servant is like, I've seen this guy. He's a son of Jesse. He's skillful. He's a skillful musician. He's also a worshiper of God. And verse 18 tells us so much. Verse 18 tells us so much about the, the character of David. Again, just contrast what we read here in verse 18 with what we know of Saul. Again, David, he's a skillful worshiper. A worshiper. He's a warrior. He speaks well, which means he's humble and teachable. And the Lord is with him. So David, he's being faithful. He's being faithful to God, and so God opens up a door for him. We read this in verse 21. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became, became one of his armor bearers. So again, we, we see David, he's elevated. He's elevated. Because of his faithfulness to God, God raises him up. He's faithful being a son to Jesse, and guess what? He was given more responsibilities, and he would end up being a, a shepherd for his dad's flock. And he was faithful in that. And we see that in this verse that he was elevated from a shepherd to being an armor bearer for the king. In the next few weeks, we'll see that David will be elevated to, to be a, a, a king. And it's not the king, but elevated to be a, a general in Saul's army. And eventually, he'll be raised up to be a, the king himself. And so, as we close here today, again, I want you to see that, that contrast between chapters 15 and 16. Again, Saul and his disobedience leads to his demise. Disobedience to God leads to his destruction. And we see here in chapter 16, David, he's faithful, and God gives him his grace and provision. And again, the, the big idea for today is that disobedience leads to destruction, but God gives grace and provision to those who wait faithfully for him. With that said, I want to ask a question of us this morning. Is who do you relate to more this morning? 
Is it Saul or is it David? And who would you relate to most today? Is it Saul or is it David? Again, remember, Saul, he was disobedient to God, but he didn't feel like he was. He modified what God asked him to do in order to get what he wanted. He modified what God commanded him to do because he was concerned with his image and his reputation in the eyes of the people. And when this disobedience blew up in his face, again, who did Saul blame? He blamed other people. It wasn't his fault. Well, David, he was someone who was lowly and humble and faithful to God. He was faithful to his dad. He was faithful as a shepherd. He was faithful to Saul. And he was faithful to God. And David, again, he wasn't perfect, and we'll read over that uh, uh, in other places in Scripture, but overall, he was faithful to God. Now, if you're anything at all like me, you might be more like Saul than you like to admit. And I've shared that several times over the last few weeks, that we're probably more like Saul than unlike him. And so, how do we move away from being like Saul to being more like David? How do we move away from disobedience towards God, towards being faithful in him. Well, remember, David is a man after God's own heart. He's someone who knew God's heart, who wanted to obey him and be faithful to him. And so my question for us today is, how can we do that? How can we move this week to work towards greater alignment with God's heart? How can we know more about who he wants us to be and who he is and his character? How can we do that this week? Is it digging into his word more and understanding his character more through that? Is it spending time in silence and solitude and prayer to hear from him, to to get rid of all the other outside noises that kind of can teach a false truth to us about who we are and what we should be about, but to hear him in, in silence and solitude and prayer? Maybe it's spending more time in Christian community in order to be challenged to live faithfully to God. So my question here as we close today is, what can you do this week, this week to work towards aligning your heart with God's? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your word. We just ask that you just move these words from your word in our hearts and minds and help us to be faithful to you just like you are faithful to us. And Lord, we're thankful for for David's example. And God, we're thankful that you are God who gives us ways to connect with you and to have your spirit continue to help us draw closer and closer to you and become more and more like your son. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.